Welcome to Commissioner's Corner. I'm Commissioner Charlotte Garrido. Today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about history of Kitsap County and especially of South Kitsap County. In the work that I do, we spend a lot of time talking about policies for the current population and thinking a little to the future of how that's going to impact people in the future. But I've also learned that it's valuable to know a little bit about our past. And I have learned quite a bit over the years about past uh, years in Kitsap County. This county was formed in 1857. And like many parts of this nation, um, mi migrants and immigrants from across the world and across the United States began to filter into Kitsap County in the middle 1850s. Um, in 1853, the uh, Washington separated from the Oregon Territory, and in 1854-1855, a series of, of treaties with the Indian tribes um, allowed uh, non-Indians to settle in certain areas of the county. Kitsap County was surveyed in 1854 according to the United States grid system. And by 1900, 1909, um, especially along the water, most of our um, neighborhoods were pretty much platted the, the way they are today, which is fairly surprising when you look at a map and think that we've had so much more development in recent years than we had uh, way back then. It wasn't necessarily developed, but it was platted significantly. Most of our early settlers were uh, lumbermen and just people who were moving west to settle. Um, the migrants came, the immigrants came, um, I'm sorry, the immigrants came mostly from, um, but more than 50% of them, from Scandinavian countries. We had quite a few Canadians that settled this area and um, from other parts of the world and, and the United States as well. After about World War Two, we began to see a lot of African Americans moving to the area to work at the shipyard. But I live in Olala, and so I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of Olala families who settled early. Um, the Nelsons, the Fagaroods, the Gangnas, the Willocks, um, the Tallmans. And um, as I've been a county commissioner, as we began to uh, acquire properties like Howe Farm, I met Isabel McPherson Birkenfeld, whose McPherson grandparents had settled in about 1899 um, on what is now the Howe Farm. They later sold it. She told me about uh, adventures there. They later sold that property to the Howe family in the 1940s. I've also talked lots and lots with a, a dear lady, Cora Brinton, from the Southworth area. Um, she, I, I got to know her during a, a time in the eight, 1980s when um, Kitsap County was talking about a land swap of the Harper Park um, for land elsewhere in the county. And she brought out the most wonderful photos and stories of the Southworth and Harper area and how important that area was to the, the people who lived there. They still take care of Harper Park. So I also know Lillian Walker very well. A recent book about her, Lillian Walker, Washington State Civil Rights Pioneer, was um, put together by, it was, it's an oral history put together by the Secretary of State's office. And it's a re she tells some really valuable stories of what it was like to be an African American settling in this area um, during World War II and since. Some very powerful stories. But to go back to the, the growth of Kitsap County, um, 30 new post offices were developed in this county between 1884 and 19. 1893. So that tells you how great the population was growing at that time. We think that we have lots of, of growth now, but given the numbers of people who had started in about 1860, we had 503 residents, and by I think it was 1890, we had more like 18,000. So that was considered a real population um, burst at the time. So I'd like to talk with a descendant of one of the families in the Olala area 
who um, can, I'd love to hear some of his stories about growing up and, and hearing the tales from his grandparents and his, his parents about what early years were in Kitsap County. His name's George Willock, and he's going to tell us a lot about um, Command Point, I believe. Welcome, George. Thank you. And uh, maybe you'll start by just talking a little bit about Marshall and Rose Willock. Okay. Um, Marshall and Rose Willock were my grandparents. Um, Marshall was the son of John A. Willock and Lucy Willock. Uh, they came out to Fregaria in um, 1882 and uh, established a 160-acre homestead at Command Point, just south of uh, Fregaria. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, five children. Uh, Marshall was one of them. Um, uh, his sister, Cora Willock, um, was the first teacher at the Olala School in the 1890s. Um, anyhow, um, Marshall Willock, my grandfather, I, I didn't actually know him personally because he passed away 10 years before I was born, uh, but I know a lot about him. Uh, he was a, uh, he was mostly known as a, he was a captain on the Mosquito Fleet and he did the Bellingham run on, on, this, on a boat called the Bellingham for many years until um, around 1915 when, when uh, four of their five children, one of whom was my dad, were born. He, he gave up steamboating and became a full-time uh, farmer uh, out at the uh, Fregaria place. Uh, he married Rose, Will uh, Rose Parkhurst, who was my grandmother. Uh, she came out here from Holton, Kansas in 1900 for her health because uh, they, her doctors felt that the, that the Kansas winters were too harsh for her to, <laughs> her, uh, for her to, to take. Uh, so they were married in 1908 and um, um, they had uh, uh, five children, three three girls, my Aunt Louise, my Aunt Hertha, my Aunt Glenn, and my Aunt, my Aunt Marion, and then my dad, who was John P. Willock, uh, who was born in 1912. Um, Tell us a little bit more about Marshall's um, work as a captain. I, I don't know too much really about that, except that he was a captain. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the... Um, one of the rumors that I've heard in just recent years was that one of the reasons he gave up steamboating was that he had a uh, a tendency to sleepwalk, which <laughs> if you're on a boat is not <laughs> that's <laughs> a uncomfortable. Good thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, he was he was well respected as a captain, and uh, uh, he's mentioned in a couple of different books on the Mosquito Fleet. One's called Isl Island of the Sea Breezes, which is mostly about Vashon Island. And then he's mentioned in uh, Ships of the Inland Sea by Gordon Newell. Good, good. I'll have to look those up. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Cora as a school teacher in the 1890s? What were the school rooms like and, and the classes? Uh, well, uh, small, of course, a little wooden building. The first Olala school was located uh, in, in Olala near just down the road from where the present Olala School is. It, it was at the intersection of uh, Forsman Road and Banner Road, mm -hmm. or excuse me, or, and um, Olala. Olala Valley Road. It's just one room, and uh, uh, I imagine that Cora probably commuted back and forth the six miles from my grandparents' house, uh, probably on horseback, and uh, that's, you talk about your grandparents' house, and you mentioned the Fregaria place earlier. Can you tell us any more about it? Um, I, it the house burned in 1949 when I, was, uh, when I was just four years old, so I can't remember too much about the house except that, um, that it was a two-story wood-framed house with, uh, with shingles on the outside, no paint, uh, wood stove inside, and... Um, uh, I don't believe it ever had electricity. So do you know what caused the fire? Yes. Uh, my aunt, um, Glenn, uh, and my grandmother, Rose, were, were uh, canning fruit uh, 
using a wood stove and somehow the stove got too hot and set the house on fire and being all, all wood, uh, it just it went up in a very short amount of time. Quickly. Yep. So does that mean that all of any photographs or any mementos from the family are gone? They're gone. They're, anything that was in that house was gone. So, yeah. That's a big loss, isn't it? It is, yeah. So um, does the family still own that property? Um, parts of it. Uh, it's it's been it w the part that Marshall owned was one third of the homestead, about 50 acres, and uh, it's since been parts have been sold uh, at, uh, to various relatives. Uh, right now, my brother Jerry Willock lives on the, the pr premises uh, right next door to the house where I grew up out there, and uh, and I own a 12 acre up part in the uplands part of the. Uh, of the property that's uh, it was logged in the 1990s and replanted it and I'm uh, managing it as a tree farm. Oh great. I have filed I have a stewardship plan filed with the county and and uh, I'm, I'm one of the main reasons I'm doing that is to just preserve a little bit of the the woods that we used to just to, when I was a kid we had the ro roam of we had the uh, the run of uh, hundreds of acres of woods, forest land out there, both on and off our property. So what did, what did kids do as they roamed the forest? Uh, well, we rode our horse on trails through there. Uh, I did a lot of brush picking when I was in high, junior high and high school. A lot of my friends at that time were, had part-time jobs like working at a, as box boys at the grocery store for a dollar an hour and I felt quite lucky because I, I could make three times that picking brush. Uh, <laughs> so what did you do in the summer for fun as relaxation as well, a kid? Well, in Alala? Uh, one of the things we did was um, was swimming in a, a uh, swimming pool. It was known as Genghis's Pool. It was on uh, just off of Figueria Road, down the road from our house, and um, you could access it by through trails through the woods. And uh, uh, this fellow named Art Genghis was a Norwegian who came out uh, around the turn of the century, I believe, and he built a two-story nice house um, with a with a large swimming pool behind it. Uh, that um, where he, he piped uh, a little, there's a creek that ran through his property called Finney Creek. And uh, he piped that into the pool and um, uh, s established it as a little community swimming pool for, I think it was, it cost 10 cents to, to swim in the pool. Uh, it didn't have any chlorine or any, uh, you know, any of that stuff. The, the water just ran right through it. So it was kind of dark and murky and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the kids used to come from Port Orchard and all over to uh, to swim there during the, the 50s and into the early 60s. Uh, eventually, the health department caught up with him and <laughs> closed him down, and that was the end of that. But Art was a he was a pretty interesting guy. He he uh, I thought he was a lifelong bachelor, but I've recently heard that in, in the according to the 1930s census. He had a, a wife and a daughter, but somewhere along the line they left and he just lived by himself in the basement of this house. It was an unusual house, wasn't it? Uh, in unusual in what way? Architecturally? Um, it was uh, just, a, it was a big two-story house and very nice. Uh, probably had some Scandinavian lines to it, uh -huh. him being from Norway. Having a swimming pool in the community is kind of unusual too, isn't it? I would say so, yes. I wonder what gave him the idea to put a swimming pool in. in I, I had no idea, but I know he just enjoyed having, having all these neighborhood people come and, go and swim. Uh, one of the things the pool had was a, um, was a big cedar log that, that hung out over the pool about halfway, half the length of it, with a with a hole in in the uh, at the end with a peg in it, and the idea was to try and see if you can walk out there and pull the peg out and 
walk back without falling in, and I never saw anybody really <laughs> accomplish that. That's really funny. Thank you, George. We're going to take a, br a break for a moment. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Commissioner's Corner. Today we're talking to George Willock, who's talking, telling us a lot about his growing up years and those of his father and um, the stories of his grandparents in Fregaria. Where the heck is Fregaria, George? Okay. Fregaria is a little community on the, on the water. Uh, it's, it's located on Colvis Passage, about uh, three miles south of the north end of Colvis Passage. Um, to access, to get there now, it, you would turn off of Banner Road onto Fregaria Road. Um, uh, in the in its heyday, Fregaria had a uh, it was the hub of the community. There was a store and a, a dock where this where the uh, steamboats came came and went, and uh, it's where everybody gathered. Uh, my grandparents' uh, homestead was located oh maybe a half mile from there, and there was a trail that they took. Uh, it kind of wound down from the end of uh, Willock Road uh, uh, across Finney Creek and into Fregaria, and um, that was a, a daily trek for members, my grandparents. And one story I've, I um, was told was that my uh, th the community wanted to, to build to build a new bridge across Finney Creek, and uh, my grandfather um, was more inclined to uh, put that effort into uh, improving the, a road, the roads in that area. He, in fact, he was a member of the Good Roads Association. Was he? Yes, and um, uh, the story I heard was that uh, uh, when they wouldn't give him some kind of a right-of-way over the, the bridge, he refused to put any money into it, but he was the first one to cross it when it was completed. So the road from Banner to Fregaria um, is still a fairly windy little road. It is. It follows Finney Creek just down uh -huh. down to the water. Uh, the 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 building that housed the store is still there, and it's a it's a residence now. Uh, the dock is pretty much gone, but you can still mm -hmm. see the pilings. And wasn't there a church? In Fregaria at one time? There was a church uh, at the upper end of Fregaria Road between Banner Road and, o and um, Orchard Road. It's where the present, um, where the Olala Grange meets now. Oh. It was a church, and um, I believe that the minister uh, actually was from Vashon Island, and he would conduct a service in Vi on Vashon Island and then row across by rowboat and conduct the service. Uh, uh, at the Fregaria Church. Oh my. Well, actually, there was quite a bit of marine travel in the day, wasn't there? That was, that was the only way to get around. There were virtually no roads. So the, uh, uh, the mosquito fleet uh, was everywhere. Um, it, it zigzagged uh, down Colvis Passage. Uh, it went from Southworth to uh, Cove over on Vashon Island and then, and then back to Fregaria. And then it uh, stopped at uh, Olala. And then it then it stopped at Lysabula over on Vashon Island, and then it and then over to Gay Harbor, and and, to, and then Tacoma. It was for transportation for people, but there were also goods and goods were lots shipped. Lots of lots of produce was shipped from it's Kitsap to Seattle. We supplied right. a lot yeah. of Seattle. Yeah, food. my grand my grandparents raised uh, strawberries that they sold, and uh, and just a, l a lot of. Uh, Everyone had gardens, and uh, a lot of people were uh, sh shipped produce to Seattle. Uh -huh. That's that's where it came from. So, do you know about how s uh, strawberries were shipped? For example, were they not in kegs, uh, barrels? I I assume they were probably in flats, but I I don't know for sure. Actually, some of the the lore that I've read said that they they shipped some of them in big yeah, that could be barrels. Yeah. And even animals were com uh, were transported on these oh yeah boats yeah, yeah. and was there a local high school that 
people attended in Kitsap? Uh, there was, but it was it, difficult to get there. And uh, for that reason, uh, my, my dad, John Willock, and, and um, all but his youngest sister were farmed out for high school. My dad lived with a family over on Vashon Island for his, uh, his first two years of high school, and then I believe his senior year, uh, the, by that time the roads had been improved enough and there was bus service and he spent his last year at uh, South Kitsap High School. As I understand, there weren't very many internal roads um, early because um, it was difficult to get through the forest land and um, some of the pictures I've seen of early roads along Long Lake, for example, were pretty treacherous. You could lose wagon wheels on them. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, and especially in the winter, they were very muddy. Yeah. So t how was it to live in Kitsap County and, and go to school or be farmed out, as you say, um, away from your family while you were going to school? Did your father ever talk about that? Uh, I think he enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, throughout his life, he had friends fr from Vashon Island that he would mm -hmm. stay in touch with. So he would go over um, on a Monday and stay the week and come home on the weekend? I would imagine, yeah. And that was fairly common for people who lived in this area? Yes. Oh. yes. Interesting. I, I believe that Cora Brinton, who you, you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. I think that Cora also went to high school on Vashon Island. I didn't talk to her about that. I'll have to ask uh, her. I believe she mentioned that to me once. You know, one of the things that Cora has talked to me at, uh, quite a bit about was the brick factory in Harper and the building materials that uh, what a fine quality bricks uh, were produced there, but how they used, uh, and I'm rem not remembering the term, um, for the lesser quality um, bricks to build their house in, in uh, Harper, Southworth, so Southworth Drive. What other kinds of building materials were available in early Kitsap County? Uh, probably just concrete and, well, of course, wood. Most, you know, most houses were built out of wood. From the forest? From the forest, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, concrete, that brings to, to mind the fact that in the early days, you could buy house plans from Sears yes. and, um, and build these lovely homes, and we still see some of them um, on the streets of Port Orchard, for it, as a matter of fact. Um, but they used sand from the beaches, and so some of the, the um, houses are beginning to erode a little bit where the sea salt um, is, uh, is um, causing some damage in, in the, the concrete see, that was yeah. built at the time. Um, have you seen uh, many houses built with local bricks, or do you know any stories of, of how far from Kitsap the bricks were I think shipped? Most, I think most of them were shipped to uh, Seattle. Uh, and I believe that when they rebuilt Seattle after the, the big fire, I can't remember what, what year that was, but uh, probably a lot of the bricks for the, the uh, buildings in Seattle came mm -hmm. from that brickyard. Well, I know they were known to be quite premium. Yes. Um, and I believe that the, the brick, the clay was discovered in about 1898 or 1899, and that brick factory yeah. worked into the 30s yes. before it was closed. So that um, Cora used to talk about how they would bring the, the clay and the bricks down um, to be uh, fired and then loaded right there in the estuary yeah. onto boats and, and yeah, taken to Seattle. There, there was a, they had a little, like a narrow gauge railway to bring the, mine the clay and bring it down and build, make the bricks. And uh, at, in those days, there was a causeway across the est estuary uh, that connected what Southworth Drive and now what now is Olympiad Drive. And it opened in the middle so that a tugboat could come in at high tide and, and take a load of bricks out. Really? Yes. And so what happened to the causeway? Do you know? It was replaced by the road, yeah, by Olympiad Drive. Uh -huh. And uh, at low tide, though, you when you look out from the side of the brickyard, you can still see the stubs of the pilings sticking up where the causeway ran. Do you know... Um, what, what kind of, of 
what led to the to the need for a road there? That I don't. Uh huh. Well, that's one of the things that influences to us mm. today because one of the decisions that we're looking at is is opening. Uh, we will leave a roadway across there, but uh, allowing more flow of water into the estuary so that the estuary is um, performing its function more clearly. Right. So. Um, well, George, thank you so much for talking to us about some of the history that you know about South Kitsap. I think it's been so informative and fun to hear some of the stories. I like the swimming pool story and, and uh, some of the, the tales of your own childhood, as well as hearing about your father and your grandparents' um, early days here. Thank you again to George Willock for being here. Thank you for joining us here on Commissioner's Corner. We'll see you next time.